Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the My Bourbon Journey Whiskey Review Channel. Uh, tonight's live stream. I'm super excited for uh, my guest tonight. Um, this is somebody who I think most of you are already going to know. Uh, he's been involved in the whiskey world um, for a lot of years now, and I was excited that once I was able to uh, reach out to Lou, that we were able to put a little something together uh, for this live stream. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to announce tonight's guest, uh, Lou Bryson, the uh, author of Tasting Whiskey. Uh, Lou, thanks for uh, joining me tonight. Happy to be here. Not a problem. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. So before we kind of uh, get into everything, uh, let's do this. I'll see who we've got in the, uh, the chat real quick, and then um, we'll kind of get into a little bit of this. So all right. So right now we've got, and I did ask a few of the guys before that if uh, people have questions to uh, send them my way. So if uh, they have a few questions for you, I might uh, fire a few of those random, random things. Nothing political, you. no politics. Nothing, no, no <laughs> politics, no politics. That's, that's absolutely right. So, yeah. all right, so Eric Waits in here. Hey, Eric, Dan Trout, George Kaplan. Hey guys, appreciate that. Christopher David right now. Yeah, people will start to kind of pop in here as we go. So. Um, all right. So I guess really what I try to do, um, with, uh, with my guests and especially ones that are now going to be, uh, super interesting to, uh, listen to their, uh, their story. If you don't mind, um, just tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your, your background, things along those lines. Sure. Um, I, uh, I live in Pennsylvania. I grew up, uh, about 50 miles from where I live now. Uh, in between that, I actually lived in Kentucky for a while, uh, lived in California for a bit, lived in New England, lived in D.C., and finally wound up back here well, not quite 30 years ago. Um, I was originally a librarian, um, and then I got really interested in, uh, in beer, um, started uh, visiting breweries and and learning everything i could about it i homebrewed for a little bit uh i started writing about beer actually in uh, in 1994 and then um my uh job fell through i got laid off and i was out of work well i was doing some temp work i was doing this and that here and there but um i started writing um that was around around 95 and um i was uh doing some stuff for a local beer store newsletter and somebody got it up to malt advocate uh which at that time was a beer magazine um and i got asked to do a piece and one thing led to another and in 96 i became the managing editor um i mean it wasn't a big magazine at the time uh it's i mean it's grown phenomenally uh, the thing was, um, right about 96, uh, that was when the, uh, craft brewing thing started getting kind of dicey and ads disappeared. So, uh, John Hansel who owned the magazine, founded the magazine, uh, had always been a whiskey drinker and, uh, essentially decided there was no magazine about whiskey. Why not become that? And, uh, uh, told me I could keep my job if I learned to drink whiskey, uh, which, you know, that took about three seconds. Um, but I needed, I, I needed help. I needed instruction. I didn't know anything about whiskey. All I knew about whiskey was it was hot. Um, you know, every time I took a drink, it felt like a mule kicked me in the face. And, um, so, you know, he started giving me samples and I, you know, it still felt like hot. He finally told me and I, say this in my book it's you just got to drink it every day uh because um i mean at a certain level it's about pain uh you have um taste buds on your tongue but you also have pain receptors and these pain receptors uh the same pain receptors uh react to alcohol actual heat and uh capsaicin the stuff in hot peppers um once you I mean, essentially, once you hit those receptors with alcohol every day, they get my my wife is uh, a biologist. She actually does drug research for uh, a pharmaceutical company. Uh, she she says oh, you, you need to upregulate them. 
So they get, <laughs> right. well, they, um, they get used to it. And essentially, as they get used to that alcohol, they stop screaming. And then your brain can hear what your nose and your tongue is telling it. But until then, that pain is essentially screaming so loud, the rest of them are coming through. You're still tasting it. You're still smelling it. Your brain's just not hearing it. And I can still remember I was drinking a, a dram of Dalmore, and I'm just like, oh, God. Here and I tasted fudge. And that was, I was off and running. Um, and that, you know, there was plenty to write about because um, I knew nothing. So, uh Everything I went to visit, everything I tasted was a learning experience and I would learn stuff and I'd be able to write about it. I got excited about it. Um, I went to uh, Kentucky for the Kentucky Bourbon Festival and I want to say 97 um, and just learned an awful amount. It was fantastic. The, um, you know, the distillers were very excited that anybody, well, I mean, they were excited anybody gave a damn, to be honest. And I just I was just thinking back on it about six months ago. You know, 1996 was a really dumb time to start writing about whiskey because, I mean, the sales of bourbon were still going down. I remember the first couple of big stories I wrote about bourbon essentially started out, well, you know, the sales are not down as much this year as they were last year, but they were still down. It was, yeah. it was a tough time. The only whiskey that was doing well was Irish, and it was so small nobody noticed. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I guess for you, when, when you say that in terms of that time frame, you know, it might've been like kind of looking back, maybe you'll agree or not, but it seems like maybe that would have been like a really good time because now everything that's being introduced to, to the market is now fresh for everybody who's kind of picking up on these and well, it was creating some, it was also a great time because I mean, you know, just as a career, no, nobody else was doing it. You know, at that time, I don't know, 96, 97, there were maybe seven other whiskey writers in the world. So I had a chance to establish myself. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm not sure I could nowadays. A lot of these, I'll tell you what, <laughs> young writers are very energetic. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so I mean, happily for, for me as a, um, uh, as somebody who's trying to support a family, well, trying to help the support of him, my wife really supports the family. Uh, it's, um, it's good. I got established and now I have, I've got, I've got perspective. I've got breadth. Um, I mean, I still, I continued to write about beer. So I actually just, uh, had a story go up on the daily beast today about rye whiskey, um, drawing parallels between the rise of rye whiskey and the rise of craft beer brewing. I mean, I, I see that stuff, um, I don't know, I don't want to say automatically, but instinctively. I make those those parallels. I can see the the connections between um, beer and whiskey. I see the, um, the similarities with the brewing process. Uh, a lot of people just really ignore the brewing in whiskey, and <laughs> that's some huge flavor formation taking place there. Um, and it's... You know, that has helped me. The other thing, and I think the thing that um, really helped the book a lot, uh, working at, at Malt Advocate and then later Whiskey Advocate, I was exposed to everything. You know, bourbon, scotch, rye. We were on the uh, the rebirth of rye from the very first moments. Uh, Canadian. We were way ahead of the curve on Canadian. Um, Irish, Japanese. Japanese was in we were writing about Japanese when people didn't even know Japanese, the Japanese distilleries existed. So um, that was, that was fantastic. I, I really got an education just, and that's the other, you know, every three months, every um, yeah, every three months, some of the best writers in the world would send me stories about whiskey. And I'd, I'd learn from that too. Um, it was a great place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's a, that's an interesting point, you know, that, that you make, you know, um, you know, with, with that time period of, of when you started and, and were able to produce the content that you, that you were and that you have, it allowed a lot of the people who are now really into all of what we're doing, the ability to, you know, just feed off of you, get that knowledge, read those books, really all of that. So, I mean, 
you know, you guys kind of set the the way for all of us to really, you know, kind of either springboard or or allow us to really enjoy this. Well, that's the, the back history and story of all. Yeah, that. the whole idea of tasting whiskey uh, was I wanted to let people get a jump start of what I had done. I mean, that book is essentially twenty years of what it. I mean, what it took me twenty years to learn. Um, and it's all all in there. And the <laughs> the big favor I did everybody was I threw out all the bullshit too because there's a lot of that in <laughs> there still is. Um, and I just you know I luckily I had a guy uh, over my shoulder a friend of mine Sam Kamlenik he's uh, the copy editor for Whiskey Advocate still is and uh, Sam and I are really good friends. Uh, and he's not just a good copy editor, you know, punctuation, word choice, all that jazz. He also really knows whiskey. He's, um, I don't think there's many people know more about Pennsylvania rye whiskey than Sam does. Uh, history, production, taste. I mean, he's got a, a great library of old, old Pennsylvania rye whiskeys that uh, he and I have tasted through a number of times. Um, he actually has enough Michter's rye in his uh i don't know what liquor cabinet closet basement whatever you want to call it that every christmas he makes a michter's whiskey cake he can actually just like use michter's rye making a cake yeah and you're and and, and probably the interesting part is you're you're probably even referring back to oh you know, i am oh old, yeah i'm old, sorry old, yeah the old, the old yeah i'm talking about the michters, old michters and yeah. stuff in the jug yeah 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 because that's that's the thing i mean the the Either the the you know younger people or a lot of people now just associate Michter's as as a Kentucky spirit and right. not and don't think back to it like um you know the days of like Dick Stoll and those guys when they yeah. were producing that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. Is that you know Michter's? I mean, it's got the lineage that goes back to Pennsylvania, starting out you know there. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually um, actually visited the old Michter's when it was still in operation. Uh, I remember dropping in there and, and, uh, taking the tour, um, which is, you know, I had no idea what I was doing then. I wasn't a, I wasn't a whiskey drinker. I was just, you know, it was, we were out on a Saturday afternoon. It was a fun thing to do. And we stopped in. I had no idea, idea there was a place making rye and bourbon there. Just, a, I mean, it was, I don't know, 40 minutes from my house where I grew up in Lancaster County. And, uh, but yeah. And then Dick Stoll, Dick's still around. I've met him. He's making whiskey uh, with Stolen Wolf in in Limits, Pennsylvania. I that was wow. Sorry, I I, I pretty much fanboyed there. Yeah, I got that's Dick okay. Stoll. That's okay. I got Dick Stoll to sign my bottle of Hirsch, sixteen year old. I, I kind of I was kind of glad you brought up that point because yeah. we were talking a little bit before offhand when you had mentioned the Hirsch. He yeah. had a big involvement in in producing you know that that whiskey that is is so coveted nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, that's the, the Hirsch, which is, which is Michter's. I mean, it was, it was bought by, uh, by a church and, and then bottled later. Uh, that is, that was the thing that, I, I mean, whenever people got started talking about what bourbon was and what it wasn't, I already knew that bourbon was made in Pennsylvania. So I was, I was kind of ahead of the game. So I was ready to not believe everything. And I wanted to go and find out that what the truth was myself. Yeah. Um, so that really, really kind of primed me for that. And that was useful. Uh, I had the same thing with beer. Um, Yingling um, was here in Pennsylvania. I was drinking Yingling from, I want to say the year after I graduated from college. I, you know, and I always knew that there was another brewery that you could drink from other than Miller and Bud and Coors, even before yeah. the crafts came along. So I got, I got lucky. I mean, you know, I got the white hairs to prove it. I've been <laughs> around, but yeah. I wasn't just, wasn't just sitting around. I was, I was drinking around. That's yeah. <laughs> and, and it was, and, and I thought the, like the, the Northeast like that was, was very well known for the rye just because of the climate yeah. and all of that. It was a, you know, a good well, the climate and the um, uh, the demographics. Uh, we had a lot of a lot of Germans, a lot of Eastern Europeans. Um, actually, the uh, I think it was the town. No, it was Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania, um, which is just you know 
20 minutes down the road from where the whiskey advocate offices were still are my, my, my mistake. I'm not there anymore, but they are. Um, <laughs> Bethlehem actually had a, uh, a town distillery. Uh, they were a bunch of um, Moravians from uh, part of what's now the Czech Republic. And um, they hired a distiller to come over and, and make rye whiskey. I mean, back, way back. So, yeah. Well, do, uh, do we want to, I guess what we could do is maybe just do a little bit of a, um, a formal introduction of your book and you can let everybody know. I know we kind of touched upon it a little bit, but I'd like for everybody to kind of hear from you a little bit more of, of what they can kind of expect if they pick up the book and, and kind of what it was really all about and, and a little bit of, um, you know, why you ultimately decided to, to go down the road of, of, you know, writing a book. Okay. Um, well, first off, I had, I had written books before I did, um, uh, brewery guidebooks, uh, um, Pennsylvania and Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New York, and New Jersey. Um, so I, I knew I had it in me to do a long form. Um, my family is still not happy because it just, it consumes your life. You get, and I know by the end of this one, the one I'm working on now, there's going to be paper all over the dining room table and I'm going to be up till two in the morning pounding away. And, but that's, I mean, that's essentially what you, what you accept when you take this on. Um, I, I was thinking about doing a book, uh, a whiskey book. I thought the, um, I thought the time had come along and, I was actually approached by um, story publications. A um, friend of mine had done a, um, a beer book for them. And while they were meeting with him, happened to mention, you know, we were thinking about doing a whiskey book. Do you know anybody? And he was good enough. I mean, the guy's name is John Hall. He's, um, he's one of my best friends. He's a great beer writer himself. Uh, in fact, he's, <laughs> let me just plug his book. He's got a great new book out called Think Beer, Drink Beer. John Hall, get it. Really good book. I'm pretty sure I'm blurbed on the cover, but I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah. John dropped my name and uh, got me, um, got story interested. Uh, I did a sample chapter and an outline and we were off. And I think the, you know, initially what it was supposed to be was a book a lot like uh, Randy Mosher's Tasting Beer, which he did for them, uh, which has done phenomenally well. Great book. I took a look at Randy's book and really started digging into it and thinking about it and realized that I had to write a different kind of book. Um, Randy was able to write the book that he did because uh, beer knowledge was a lot further ahead than whiskey knowledge is, or at least was at the time I wrote the book. Um, I realized when I was writing that book, I had, uh, there were just too many people that didn't really even have any idea how whiskey was made. Um, we had, um, five major whiskey making areas, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, America, Japan, uh, and then all the myriad craft distilleries that were, that were starting up. Um, people really didn't understand the differences. Um, uh, I knew that because, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I didn't really know the differences until I started digging into it. Um, and I figure, you know, if somebody in, in my position there at the magazine didn't know everything, there's a pretty good chance that most people didn't either. Um, and so I decided what, and I talked to, talk the publisher and the editor into this, we needed to do something that was at a more, um, educational basic level. And that's what we wound up doing. Um, a friend of mine, uh, when he read the book said to me, your book is really kind of li like a liberal arts education. You've got history, geography, um, you've got uh, storytelling, uh, you, you even have some metallurgy in there. And and he's right. I mean, I, I deliberately designed the book to essentially do everything about whiskey except review individual whiskeys. And the reason I decided not to do that was... Uh, as I said, I'd done some uh, regional guidebooks to to craft breweries, and they kept closing, and new ones start kept opening. And I realized, you know, the book was never current for more than about two years, three at the most. And I didn't want to have a book like that. I wanted to have a book that would continue to be. I mean, we're 
we talked about doing a, a second edition, but finally decided we didn't really need to. Um, not enough has changed since, I mean, the book came out in October of 2014. Um, I would say that over 85% of it still holds up, uh, is still, still right. I mean, actually more than that is, is still right. There's just some stuff that, that isn't up to date. Um, and I think that's, that's worked out well. It's a, it's a book that, um, it's a book that appeals to a wide range of, of, of whiskey drinkers. Yeah, that was, that was, that was the one thing that, that really appealed to me was before, before I knew exactly what it was, because, you know, going into whenever you're going to kind of prepare yourself for reading a book, you know, you're, you thinking that you're going to get from, you know, A to Z, whatever it is, a full story. And the one thing I liked about this early on was the fact that this was to me, a lot of books within a book. And, and it really broke down a lot of the important aspects of a lot of areas of, of whiskey. And to have a book that's more of a, it's a, it's a fantastic book. But I, what I also liked was that it's, it's a bit of a guide and, and it really led you down these different paths of, of different knowledge. And when you're finished reading it, you really feel like, well, okay, you may not know everything about the subject, but you know a lot of the basics that you may never have known if you would have just read a book that was just about bourbon or Irish whiskey or, or yeah. scotch. And this, this led you down all those different avenues. So you got a little bit of, of everything, which was, for me, fantastic. I, I mean, I like... I like whiskeys from from just about well no from all of the different regions I like there are craft whiskeys I like um, you know that's and I wouldn't have I wouldn't have gotten to that if I hadn't tried them if I hadn't I mean essentially I had to try them because it was my job and that's when I realized I wanted to find out more about them and I think that's you know there's a, a, a thing they've been saying in craft beer for a long time the um the more you know the better it tastes and i mean that's a yeah that's a that's a marketer's thing you know they want you to, to believe that but it's it's true because you know what to look for you know what what it is you like you know you know better how to find another whiskey that you are going to like because you can you can figure that out uh the thing i like about that is when you know that much stuff, one of the things you learn and one of the things I, I may have talked about too much in the book, don't ask me what my favorite whiskey is. Don't ask me what the best whiskey is. That's not your answer. Your answer is, is your answer. And you got to go out and find it yourself. You got to do the work and yeah. I'm giving you the tools to do that work. Yeah. Well, you know, and I guess speaking of that, you know, when you're kind of talking about whiskey, you know, in, in that, that light, you know, like, like we're both sitting here drinking, you know, Heaven Hill bottle and bond, which up until not long ago was a $12 bottle. And, you know, yeah. and, speaking of, and speaking of like, you know, these bottles now that are, you know, hundreds or maybe even a thousand dollar, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we're, we're both enjoying and, and have a few extra bottles of something that literally not long ago was $12. Yeah. And it just goes to show you that you don't have to spend a ton of money on, on great whiskey. Yeah. Not if you know what you like, don't, exactly. don't let other people tell you what you like. That's, exactly. you know, and, yeah. and as far as that goes, I remember when, when the book first launched, the, uh, they had me, they set me up to do a bunch of, uh, interviews on Sirius, uh, satellite radio. And I still remember there was a drive time station in LA and there was a woman on there who said, how, I like Glenn Livet 12 year old. How should I drink that? I'm like, how do you like to drink it? She said, well, I put some ice in it. I'm like, well, I would put ice in it. Yep. You know, that's it. It's your whiskey. What the? Don't well, let anyone that, else tell you how to drink you know, it. And, and that is, that is exactly it. There, there are a lot of people as, as you well know, you know, in the industry that people want to tell you how to drink your whiskey. And, yes. and it's exactly the thing. Like we've now all preached, Drink it however you like it. If you want to put, you know, 
you know, some her 16 in your Coca-Cola as bad as that may be. That yeah. If you want to do it with yours, it. that's fine. Don't do it with mine. Exactly. Don't do it with mine. And, and, that's, ah. and that's the thing. Ah. And that's, the, and that's the thing. If you've got, you know, more money than time or whatever it is, and you drink sure. it however, however you want it, Absolutely. That, that is exactly it. Because there are so many people that want to tell you what to do and how to drink it, that it is. It's as simple as you enjoy it however you want. Well, I, was, I mean, that was one of the first things they told me when I went down there to Kentucky for the first time. I think it was, it was probably Jimmy Russell who said it to me first, but I think everyone did. We don't really care much how you drink it, just so long as you drink it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. Speaking yeah. of which, I'm, I'm moving on to my next one. Okay. I got a, uh, I got a sample bottle from Balcones, the Texas Pot Still bourbon. So I'm just going to, I'm opening that up right now. Yeah, that'll be a, that'll be a good transition because I, I would be very, very interested to hear your thoughts nowadays as tes as uh, Texas whiskeys have really started to gain some traction and become real popular, yeah. you know, and, and really I've had several of them and I think they're doing a fantastic, um, fantastic job with them. So yeah, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, just, overall different, yeah, yeah. different regional different regional type of whiskeys yeah yeah that's uh that's coming along isn't it um it, it, it really is okay i'm 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 happy to see that it has a synthetic cork because i'm really tired <laughs> yeah. of corks breaking man well really and, that's, tired and, of and honestly nowadays if if you're not going to put a cork on and i or and i have no problem with screw tops i mean that's oh yeah I do that. like that heaven hill right there that's a good yeah. screw top I mean, yep. it looks cheap, but it works. It does. It does exactly. It does exactly what you need. I mean, basically, once you open it, I mean, it's gonna oxidize the same way with a cork or whatever. Yeah. It is, but, you know. So, but at least, like you said, if you're gonna have a cork, make it synthetic. You're not gonna worry about your the actual cork breaking yeah. down. You know. Yeah, it's not wine. You're not getting a benefit out of air passage. Yeah. Now, have you, I'm, I'm assuming I, I, the answer is yes, but have you had recently, maybe within the last you know, year or so, um, a, a fair amount of, of different whiskeys like from Texas to kind of experience like what's Not going really. on there? No, no, I've been off that. Um, had some uh, uh, Ranger Creek. I had some... Uh, I had some Balconies. I had some, uh, no, I don't think I have had Garrison Brothers in the last year. Um, that might be it. Okay. I know, I know speaking of Texas stuff, like Iron Root uh, Distillery down there, um, I've had some of the stuff that they've sent, um, which was like their Harbinger uh, lineup. And it's, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, lineup that they're doing down there as well. So, Wow. Um, yeah. So let me ask you this. So, so since you're opening a fresh bottle there, yeah. what, what, what kind of goes through your mind? Like when you're nosing and tasting something, what is it that you're, you know, kind of evaluating and, and looking at to kind of determine whether or not that's going to be, you know, um, a good overall bourbon, not necessarily for you, but just in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm looking for, is um what some some heft some solidity of of character and and aroma and flavor the whole way through um i i mean i'll give um i'll give a pretty stiff down check to a whiskey that seems to be missing a part you know if it's got a really shy nose in the beginning or if the entry isn't much and then it, it just suddenly blossoms, that's nice, but I'd really like to get it the whole way through. I'd like it to have a, a good entry. I'd like it to have a, a firm presence on the palate as I'm drinking it. I'd like it to finish well, and then I'd like it to linger. Um, you know, I, I tend to, uh, what excuse those, uh, weak spots more than, um, down check for him, I guess, but it, it's not what I'm looking for. I don't, I'm not happy with that. Um, yeah. This seems to be ringing the bells the whole way through. Well, it, you know, and the Balcones has gotten like a real, um, you know, just again with the Texas whiskeys, a big surge of, 
of popularity. And, and I'm, I'm happy to see that these different regions are starting to get some, some more traction outside of, of Texas or outside of uh, Kentucky, just yeah. because there's a lot of other areas throughout the United States that really are producing some fantastic whiskey. That's like the, um, uh, the New York thing with the Empire Rye. I think it's a great idea. I mean, they're consciously going at it. They want to be um, a regional flavor. But, you know, that nobody wants to fall into the, uh, the trap of doing everything exactly the same. Because um, you can't. I mean, that's, that's, your, that's, your, that's your gold when you're, when you're craft. Yeah, um, absolutely. You don't well, have I just, to. I just got a, a confirmation from one of the guys. So somebody just ordered your book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, Thank you. <laughs> Ching. Yeah, there you go. So we got we got one customer for you tonight, if nothing else. So all right. <laughs> um, Very now, good. Now let, let, let me ask you this. So speaking sure. of, of um kind of those those profiles and how you're looking for things, what are your thoughts on the huge amount of of craft distillers versus like the big boys? Like how do you look at that whole market nowadays? Um, well, a couple of things. One, uh, the thing that has interested me is how much more quickly, uh, the big distillers, um, saw what was going on than the big brewers did. And I mean, obviously they have the example to, to look at, but, um, you know, things like the, the Buffalo trace experimental program beam has been on that pretty early i mean when you think about when their uh harvest series came out you know you're looking at somebody at beam saying you know let's try making whiskey with with brown rice back in i don't know what 2005 2004 which is impressive i you know they they obviously thought something's going on here i don't think it was just well, let's do something different so we aren't heaven, heaven Hill. Let's do something different so we aren't Old Forester. I, you know, they saw stuff coming and they saw the possibility that um, there were going to be people doing that stuff and they wanted to do it first. They wanted, or at least they wanted, well, they wanted to be in the game. Um, and I think the, um, you know, they have, they have the ability, they have the budget, they have the the smarts to do that stuff. As the big brewers do, it's just, uh, I think the big distillers have proven more nimble. Um, I think they've proven to have fewer bad ideas. Uh, you know, you don't see, you know, they kind of had their Zima period back in the 60s oh, yeah. and, and learned from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you can say that, uh, well, look at... Um, the flavored whiskeys, the Jack Daniels Fire, the Beam Red Stag, the that, that, and then that. But, you know, then you look at Fireball and holy God, the yeah. money they're making off of that. I'm like, you know what? I want all my friends to go out and drink Fireball because it's keeping me in Buffalo Trace. Uh, the wow. <laughs> yeah. The amount of money that whiskey is bringing in is astounding. Yeah, I mean it is it is crazy what what Fireball has has done for for them. There's there's no doubt about it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's I mean new warehouses, new packaging area, new it's yeah, no Fireball. <laughs> so so I've got a I've got a couple of I've got a couple of questions. One a little bit random. Mm -hmm. So um, and I I should say uh, thanks to Jason from the Mash and Drum for the for the super chat, which is. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's just a small little like channel donation at the time during a live stream. So thank you very much, Jason. So so here's a couple of questions um, that I that I got. So um, one of them was um, from Eric Waite was asking, "What are your thoughts about wax on bottles?" <laughs> <laughs> Because and and I think I think I know the he reason. He thinks he's beating he, me. <laughs> well, and and I know I know the reason he asked that because Eric Wade, who's in the chat tonight, has a, a whiskey review channel, and he was he was trying his hardest at one point to get the darn wax and stuff oh. off his bottle, and he was having a heck of a time. So I think that was a, 
a little bit of a, uh, I mean, a tongue in cheek question. So the thing is, if you're if you're opening a bottle of Makers or uh, one of the new packages of Knob Creek, it's done. Why can't they all be like that? God, I mean, some of them I've had to take a drill to. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I I have, I've got scars. I've cut my fingers. Some are, some are ridiculous. And and I, I still kind of like uh, outside of, you know, like makers and things along those lines that's super easy to get into these other ones. I mean, they're, they're half an inch thick and you need a, you need a jackhammer just to get into half of them. So yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, corks, as we were talking about with the synth cork, did a piece for the daily beast. I talked to uh, Jeff Arnett down at uh, Jack Daniel. Um, his first job there was quality control. And he said, you know, really, the only thing I ever got complaints about was the cork in Gentleman Jack. It's the only thing. Said so people were calling, I got a bottle of Gentleman Jack and it's musty, right? Yeah. I'll send you a new one. So <laughs> when they were, he said they were talking about redoing the package. And he's like, look, I don't care what you put on it, but we're, we're not going with the cork again. We're gonna. That's like, which, which I'm uh, honestly, I'm surprised they even use real cork anymore. To be honest, I mean, it's just yeah. what's the point? But I mean, other I mean, than I was at a, I was at an event one time. Van Winkle was there. Julian was there pouring, and he had two bottles of twenty three year old for the for the VIP tasting, and one of them was corked. Hmm. So he only had one bottle of twenty three. There were some pissed off people, and he was one of them. You know, yeah. I'm. Why use cork? Why are you using cork? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm done. No, no, that no, that's fine. So here was the other question I had from Jason, who also has a, a whiskey review channel called the Mash and Drum. Mm. Um, he, he wanted me to ask you what the oldest whiskey you had ever had was and your thoughts on that. Um, well, the the oldest in in age, uh, in terms of years in the barrel, uh, I had a I had a 48 year old scotch uh, from Glenfiddich, um, mainly because I happened to notice that the uh, the barrel had been filled in the, the year I was born. And I'm like, oh, look at this. Cool. Can I get a picture with this? And they're like, oh, we can do better than that. And they thiefed out like three ounces and it was phenomenal. It was it was fantastic. They released it. uh Two years later, as a 50-year-old, I think they would get like 7000 a bottle for it. It was really, really good. Uh, oldest bourbon I've ever had, um, probably that uh, Parker's Heritage, the 27-year-old. It tasted like a 27-year-old. I mean, it was yeah. not as... I, I mean, that six-year-old Heaven Hill, it's getting to be where that's what I want. You know, I don't really want much over 12 years old anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that become, you know, I think that's kind of people are starting to understand that the older isn't necessarily better that I think a lot of old whiskey, you know, in that, you know, 12, 15, 17, you know, for a lot of people, I don't think that that is ultimately what matches their, their profile. I mean, a lot of times, as you well know, it becomes really oaky and, and dry Right. And I don't think a lot of people who drink whiskey for the most part really enjoy that, you know? Yeah. I, you know, you sometimes yeah. wonder if they know what they're drinking. I'll tell you, yeah. you know, yeah. the thing that I really did like that's still one of my favorite bourbons ever was uh, the other um, Parker's, the Parker's Golden Heritage. And mm-hmm. it, which was a blend of young and old, you know, something from every decade he'd worked in. I, I wish we would do more of that because it was, you know, it had some of the depth of the older whiskey, but it still had the punch of the youth. I thought it was a great whiskey. What about, uh, I'm sorry, about golden anniversary. Your- That's what I was. Sorry. Parker's heritage, golden anniversary. That's what golden it was. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. What what about what about in terms of um, the the year of the bourbon like something anything going back into the, the you know the thirty years oh, right, along those lines? Um, I don't know if any if you're, any of your listeners are familiar with a, a guy named Thomas Earl McKenzie. Uh, Thomas is a um, I mean the last when I first met him he was uh, working for uh, Finger Lakes Distilling. Um, 
and he's a uh, he's from Alabama. He's uh, he, he was up there in the Finger Lakes, and just you know this thick drawl. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then he takes me back into his workroom, and he had, you know, he had whiskeys from the fifties, the sixties. We were drinking like 1960, mid sixties cream of Kentucky, and he had a a fifties era mellow corn. Uh, so that's those were some of the and the reason we were drinking them was he was trying to show me what he was aiming at because he thought that uh, essentially modern bourbon distilling had kind of gone off the off the track. Um, he was, you know, he's working on entry proof. He was lowering entry proofs. Um, he uh, it's funny. He had started out with a big pot still and uh, essentially dumped it as soon as he could and got a, a just a you know just a foot wide column from Vendome and was happy as a hog running stuff on that on that column. Um, he is at a large new distillery now, and I cannot remember the name. I apologize for that. Um, but he's done really well. I mean, he's been consulting people have, uh, I mean, I know people in the industry, uh, have a lot of respect for the guy just knows a heck of a lot. And he was kind enough to share some of those older whiskeys with me that day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I guess that's, that's another, uh, another question I actually had, um, written down was to get your thoughts on like older whiskey that maybe we would now consider like an old dusty, which may I mean old go back to the eighties versus like a whiskey now, like your thoughts on like how that was produced and, and the flavor profile of that versus, you know, now, like what, what do you kind of notice, you know, from, from those time periods? Um, I am, I'm always nervous about that because, you know, we say it doesn't change when it gets in the bottle, even though we know damn well it does. Um, so I'm a little hesitant about that, but that said, um, things were done differently. Uh, some of what was done differently was there was nowhere near as much automation. So things were less uniform. Um, so I think you got more, uh, more variation, um, there was less emphasis, at least, and you know, you're, you're looking at through the, um, through the sixties and seventies is when things were starting to fall off rather heavily. So there was no longer the emphasis on cranking it out. Uh, and, and I think you're, you're seeing that coming back now. Uh, I mean, age statements are still disappearing. Uh, I mean that, um, the heaven Hill, bonded that we were drinking it's disappeared entirely because you know i mean there's there's no getting around it they need that whiskey for other bottlings that make them more money um and that's you know that is driving uh what's in your bottle more than anything else right now yeah. uh essentially guys like you and me have done our jobs too well uh, you know <laughs> I, yeah, we're uh, consuming it too quickly yeah, you know, and we've got all these other people out there excited as hell, and they're buying everything they can, and uh, and then you know the well, I was just talking to the people at Heaven Hill the week before Henry McKenna won that best whiskey in the world at San Francisco, and they were already going crazy trying to make enough McKenna from it being best bourbon the year before, and as they said, and this is actually in the piece that just went up on the daily beast today that I did about rye whiskey, um, they're kind of, uh, kind of stuck because pulling whiskey out of the overall stock to make more McKenna makes a hole where you used to have heaven Hill six year old bonded, or maybe even, um, you know, the Evan Williams bonded or, you know, stuff. There's a rolling impact on down the road, um, Susan Wall at Heaven Hill compared it to playing whack-a-mole. It's like, yeah, we got demand here. We took care of that. Now we got more demand than supply over here. What do we do? Well, we do this. And, this, and, and you know, um, they're talking about forecasting. And forecasting is just insane. I mean, when you're a, um, 
when you're a craft distiller, it's actually kind of easy. You just make as much as you can. Um, but when you're heaven Hill, you know, how much are we making for, um, that new whiskey that people haven't even seen yet? And how much are we making for Elijah Craig and how much are we making for, and how, you know, and are we going to do a 23 year old William heaven Hill down the road or, and you just, you know, forecasting gets so complicated. It's, it's, it's just a gamble at some point, you well, know, you know, and, and that's, and that's the thing, you know, everybody gets, you know, upset that, you know, a, a solid $12, you know, mm. six year product goes away. Sure. But the, flip, but the flip side is that maybe that allows for a little bit more production of like, let's say uh, Elijah Craig barrel proof or something along those lines. So there, there is the flip side to it just simply going away. It's not going away. It's being rolled over into other product, yeah. you know, older age product, or or maybe to them a higher quality product or whatever it is that that may be. So, um, you know, and well, I of think course that, that, you know that's the other thing we've proven that we're willing to pay for it. You know, yeah, uh, exactly. yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I think we're 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 in the day and age now where you know people are willing to spend basically anything for not only a quality product, but I think nowadays a lot of this has become a little bit of, um, I, I kind of like term it like adult, um, you know, uh, baseball cards that people just want this stuff yes. because it's popular and, and there's no intention to drink it, which is a little bit troublesome from the standpoint that, you know, I really enjoy whiskey and I would like to people see people drink it and enjoy it and not just necessarily have it on a, on a shelf as like a display or something. I mean, I've got a lot of stuff back here, but I've got other bottles that are open. I mean, a lot of these are a little bit of a display, but I mean, I try to open at some point, everything will be open. You know, yeah. I, I'm not in the, in this to necessarily flip things and do all that. But um, yeah, this, it is, it's just gotten to the point now where, you know, things have gotten almost out of control where, everywhere you go for now Blanton's for, for instance, people are waiting in line for Blanton's and it's, you know, a few years ago, that wasn't the case. You could go somewhere. And no. buy Blanton's. Now it's not even the case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just had a, I just had a friend uh, text me last night, literally last night, you know, wanted to get a bottle of Blanton's. They got nothing. What, what else should I, can I get? I'm like, wow, this is just, I mean, I remember when Elmer T. Lee disappeared. I remember when Weller started to disappear. Uh, and at the same time, I remember, I remember walking into the store and seeing, you know, Van Winkle, 15 year old on the shelf. I remember walking to the store, seeing um, what hell I remember walking in and seeing five bottles of stag sitting on the shelf in February, you know, people <laughs> just didn't know. Um, yeah. and now, and now everybody does. And, you know, with the, uh, internet things don't sit on the shelf for more than a day because everybody yeah. knows if, when they go and they, they buy it. If they, ever, if they even get to a shelf now. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. That's I mean, that's like, like so many times you see there, Oh, I found this. How many did you buy? All of them. Oh, thanks. Thanks buddy. <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. I'll come over and, to your and, house. And, well, you know, and the and the flip side to that is, you know, at, at, I think a lot of times is the the person who clears the shelf. Part of the intention is to turn around, sell those, make a few bucks, and then you know, because I mean, we all know if there's an area for anybody to make money, someone's going to capitalize on that. Yeah, you know, and and unfortunately, we're in the day and age of this being a market that's hot, and people know that, and you don't even have to enjoy this to make money on it. No. You know? So, but all right. So I've got a question from uh, one of the other guys in the chat, the Dan Trout. He's a good guy, really good guy, really nice whiskey collection. He's an opener. He opens all kinds of things. So he wants to know uh, what bourbon is on your bucket list. On my bucket list. You have a bucket list bourbon, something that you've never either tried or something that you always look forward to trying. Wow. Um, I don't know that I have one. Uh, I have pretty much shot all my unicorns. <laughs> that's um, a good. 
That's a good problem to have. I mean, I would I would love to have like three more bottles of that Parker's Golden Anniversary, but that that ain't gonna happen. Uh, well, well I, no. think, I think with I think with that being said, I think you need to tell that that small little story you told me about the Hirsch that that you've got prior <laughs> to when we got online. This will probably this will probably make up for his bucket list item. I, knowing knowing Dan the way I do, um, um, I, think be, I think he'll be very envious of of that story. Back in the uh, the early two thousands. Well, first off, I said that I. I rarely buy more than two or three bottles of, of a whiskey at the same time. I I can't remember the last time I bought more than two. Uh, but in, I think it was around 2004, Benny's in Chicago put uh, the Hirsch 16 year old bourbon on sale. Uh, and this is the old, the old blue wax uh, on sale for $40 a bottle. And I, I, I got five of them. Um, and I have never regretted that. I still, I still have one unopened. I'm working on the next to last one. So let me, let me ask you this. So with that being said, so as special as that bottle is, what makes it so special to you that, that, I mean, everybody wants it, but, but as, as an whiskey expert, what is it about that, that makes that so fantastic to you. We're talking about the Hirsch. Correct. Um, and I'm I'm sorry I'm like disappearing here. I'm that's okay. You know, I, I'm opening a bottle of Booker's and there's wax <laughs> falling all over the place. What's yeah, going take on your here. time. Take your time. Um, this is a uh, a new Booker's. They just sent me Teresa's Teresa's batch. Uh, 2019 62.95, 125.9 proof. Six years, three months, and a day. So I'm gonna just. I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of of the Booker's line. Oh, yeah. I think they all do a fantastic job with those. Yeah, I haven't I've never had a bad one. Yeah. So um, is there something? Is there something that's super super special about like Hirsch? About the Hirsch. Um, I mean, about the Hirsch. The Hirsch. Um, Hirsch comes from Michters, and I'm I'm a I'm a my family's been in Pennsylvania since 1741. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania now. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm. We're moving further into Pennsylvania, into Central Pennsylvania to retire. It's, it's where my heart is. It's where I've, I've always loved to be. And the idea that uh, a whiskey that you know competes on the highest level with the best that Kentucky has ever made came from Pennsylvania, just you know. Gives me a hell of a thrill. It's also really, really good. Um, yeah. I mean, it is one of the best whiskeys I've ever had. I don't know. I don't know what came together. You know, well, I do, but I don't know why that. And but it's awfully good. Yeah. I mean, I understand that it's it's at, not actually technically a bourbon. Um, it's a fifty percent corn mash bill, not really? fifty one. That's what Chuck Cowdery has has written. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I've never, that's a little bit of a fun fact. I've never, I've never yeah. heard that, that that's technically classified as a, as a whiskey American whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, All right. So I've got, that's I've what got I mean, you know, some of it's that it's, uh, some of it's that it's rare. Some of it's that it's delicious. A lot of it is that it, I, I've, I've been to the place a number of times. I grew up around there. I drank that water growing up. I mean, it's that same limestone water. And, well, uh, and, you know, and I think a lot of us, when you, when you get into the environment, like if you're at a distillery or you're in a rick house and you're drinking from the barrel, automatically it just, it tastes better. I mean, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's like, you know, very subconscious or, or you're in the it moment, does. whatever it is, it does. But I think that's, that's part of whiskey. If you can attach something to it, uh, it does. I mean, it helps to make something better, whether it's, a physical taste or a memory or whatever it is. That's one thing that's, that's nice about whiskey is that, you know, you attach whatever you want to it to make it great to you or whatever it may be. Cause it you does know? make that kind of connection. It's um, you know, people ask me um, uh, usually someone who's uh, some other writer who's writing something for a magazine or a newspaper. One of the questions they almost almost always ask me is why did whiskey come back like this? 
you know, um, cause it was, it was dying. It was, uh, it was slumping bourbon was at half of what it was. And I think the reason is it's people want a story and bourbon's got a whiskey has a great story and it's all true. You know, I mean, there's been some marketing bullshit, but if you strip that all away, you are still left with a fantastic story. Um, you know, it's one of the things I'm uh, working on in the uh, that the new book I'm working on. This uh, new book supposed to come out about this time next year, uh, tentatively titled Whiskey Masterclass. It's it's all about building flavor, flavor components of whiskey, how you get flavors in it at all the different steps of whiskey. And one of those steps is the human element. You know, the people who make the whiskey are a huge factor in in how it tastes you know there's i mean the people who are making this decisions about how it's going to taste and then the people who are actually doing the work um i remember uh i visited uh dalmore in scotland and there's this one guy sitting in the middle of uh the still room and he's got a control panel in front of him but it's all like dials and buttons there's no screens you know he doesn't have a keyboard He's just doing this. And, uh, and he, <laughs> the guy looks up to me and he says, you know, the important thing is the meat in the machine. And it's so <laughs> true. You know, even when it's automated, somebody set the damn parameters. All you're doing when you automate distillation is making sure that the machine does the same thing that the human did every time. You know, the machine doesn't make the decisions. The human makes the decisions the machine carries them out. The, yeah. the human element is incredibly important. Um, handmade. We talk about handmade. Barrels are handmade. They're cut down by humans. They're, uh, they're sawn by humans. They're stacked by humans. They're, they're raised and, and, and uh, hooped by humans. They're filled. Well, sometimes they're filled automatically, to be honest, but, you know, the people who go through and sample all humans, whiskey is handmade. It's, it's a wonderfully authentic product product. This is, this is really good, by the way. I don't know if that has anything to do with why I'm talking like this, but <laughs> this, uh, this Booker's is pretty damn tasty. It, 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 could, it could be. I've, uh, I've, I've been uh, privy to several conversations where sometimes the whiskey does take over, which is uh, perfectly yeah. fine. Man, I got inspired there. Wow. Woo. And this is uh, this is your this is your first time trying the new Booker's release. This is that first that that new release. Yeah, I just opened it. Yeah. So what would your what would your initial thoughts be on on that? Um, I think this has a. Mm. Wow. Well, it's definitely got that all the way through thing. Um, but to be honest, most most Booker's does. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a beautiful like um coffee cake thing going on um you got the sweetness you got the caramel you got spice it's really it's um it's like a you know when in in uh in movies when the stuntman jumps off the the building and he's he's falling to his death but he actually hits that big air cushion that's about yeah. you know 25 feet deep that's what this is like i'm falling into that much flavor oh man that's really good yeah that's that is always one of the things i've enjoyed about bookers is that um that nice just mouth coating it gives you a nice a nice kentucky hug um you know yeah you would think at that proof it would be it would be beating you up but it's not it's just like you said it's a big oh yeah bring it in yeah. And, yeah. And I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume most of the time you're you're drinking your your bourbon or whiskey neat. That's how I start out. Yeah. I mean I always always try it neat first. I still remember I, I I didn't use to for the overproof stuff. And then um the first time I had Sazerac 18 year old was actually at Whiskey Fest New York and it hadn't come out yet. It was gonna be coming out the next year. And somebody told me to go over and ask Elmer T what he had under the table. So I went over and he said, Oh, and he pours the whiskey. And he says, this is a, an 18 year old rye we've been working on. Oh, I reached out and I grabbed it. And 
I'm bringing it back, and he puts out his <laughs> like puts out his hand and says, "Now I must warn you, it is 110 proof." I'm like, oh, <laughs> so I reach for the water jug, and he puts out his other hand and grabs it. He says, "But it's awful smooth." <laughs> All right, then. Oh, okay. I, and he was I, right. It was wonderful. You know, at 110, it like glass, oh, like butter. That's, yeah. That's fantastic. So, that's, that's fantastic. I guess before we, uh, before we kind of like uh, wrap, wrap things up, that's, that's always one thing I'm, I'm always interested to know is I, I'm a huge history guy. And outside of the, the short story that you just told about Elmer, do you have a, a little bit of a story with, with anybody, you know, from, from back in the day that you wouldn't mind kind of sharing with, with us something that was, you know, that kind of just, you know, always gets logged in the back of your mind as just something that's fantastic. <laughs> There's actually one I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, it's, it's in tasting whiskey, but I, I tell it all the time. Anyway, um, I was talking to Parker beam about, uh, about flavor and where it comes from in the whiskey and he got a little upset. He says, I hear all these people talking about they taste mango in my whiskey or leather or bacon. He says, I don't put mangoes or leather or bacon in my whiskey. He says, I, I put corn in my whiskey and I age in oak. And when I drink it, I taste corn and oak. <laughs> okay, then. I, I ain't going to argue with that. Yeah, you, you don't, you don't, you don't argue. You don't argue if if there's no mango or there's no any of that other stuff. Nope. There's none of that in there. Nope, I. You are right, sir. I taste corn and I taste oak. Very good. <laughs> that is that is very that is very interesting. Uh, well, he was a, he was a great guy, and I miss the hell out of him. I really do. Um, Truman Cox, uh, another great distiller who never even got to his. You know, I mean, he got to run Bowman for about a year. I think great guy one of my best friends and just died way too soon. It's, uh, it's tough. Um, you know, we're, we're losing some of the great ones, but whiskey goes on. Yeah, that it does. And that's, that's not going to uh, stop probably being produced. And it seems like, you know, there's a, a good group of people coming up that are, yes. are able to, to really produce some things. So that's, that's, that's really nice to see. So, um, I guess so before we kind of uh, wrap things up, do you want to let everybody know a little bit more about kind of what's going on with you, where they can find you at, all of, all of that? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I do a, uh, I, I write regularly for the Daily Beast. Uh, they have a, uh, a section called Half Full. Um, I mean, they're regularly, David Wondrich is in there regularly. Uh, Noah Rothbaum, our editor, writes regularly. Uh, Wayne Curtis, and Wayne Curtis is the writer I want to be when I grow up. Um, that's, that's a great place to go. I mean, my, a lot of my stuff is there. Um, bourbon plus the new bourbon magazine that Fred Minnick started. Wow. Um, I got my new issue, uh, this morning, just, I mean, fantastic production values, great writing. If, I mean, if you love bourbon, you ought to be getting that magazine. I, I wish I was in every, every issue. Um, I was the cover story in the premiere issue and I'm probably going to ask to be buried with that. I'm really proud of that. Um, it's a, it's a great magazine. Uh, those are at this point, probably the best places to find me because I've just been turned down a bunch of shit. Cause I'm working on this book. Um, <laughs> you know, I gotta be honest. Uh, and, and, you're, and you're expecting, you're expecting the, the, um, the new book out roughly this time next year. New book should be out April, 2020. Whiskey Masterclass. At least that's the the working title. Well, I think everybody everybody will be uh, looking forward to uh, to hearing that. And I will have, <clears throat> excuse me, in the replay, I'll have a, a link to where you can uh, pick up uh, Lou's uh, book mm. and, and all of that. So I'll have that. Very so good. If, if once you. we're done, you can uh, you can go and uh, check out the uh, probably Amazon link or something along those lines and and order the order the book. So, but people can find you on. Facebook, Twitter, things along oh, those good. lines. Oh, yeah, I'm on Facebook and Twitter saying things I probably shouldn't be. Yeah, well, that's okay. That's, that's most of us, so. Yes. No, well, that's good. Well, well, I want to thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate your, your time, your stories, your knowledge, uh, all of that. I had a fantastic time. I'm, uh, I'm sure everybody in the, in the chat did as, as well. So uh, thank you again for, for, sure. uh, for, for joining me. 
And uh, like I say, it's about the journey and not the destination. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks a lot.